Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned before, I am duly indebted to uh, our good friends from APSA and from Green Doors. Let me also at this point in time uh, express our gratitude to our good friends and long-time development partners, Unicon, who are in fact our hosts today. As you can see, um, most of you actually know as well and know who we are. And no, those three are not the three stooges. Um, we, uh, we refer to the young gentleman on the right as the senior partner, simply because he calls the shots. Um, that young man who's now two years old, in fact owns two properties. The interesting thing is that we are here today in the first instance because we are property investors. This is why we take advice from the banking industry and the financial services in general. Now, most of what we have heard today, as a matter of fact, supports what we as P3 do. Let's have a look at it. Very briefly, if we can revisit the P3 structure as it is today. Remember, this is an organization which has been in existence since 2003. Survived the catastrophe of 2008, 2009, and 2010, just prior to the World Cup soccer. Cup of soccer World Cup. Now, perhaps you as P3 members do not realize that the members, in fact, are the heart and soul of this organization. We live because of our members. And it's partly because of power in numbers and also because of leverage. But it's also about sharing of resources and knowledge. That's why we have right at the top membership, which means our members. As you know, we also have a financial services division where we provide our mentorship program to our members and where we provide specific financial services aimed at accommodating the needs of our members and allowing our members to become successful property investors. Over and above, we also have the divisions relating to fiduciary services. Now, fiduciary services, I will again just summarize. Planning, estate planning, which relates also to financial services. Corporate structuring, which means planning as far as trusts are concerned, registration of trusts, companies, and the registration of companies, and then of course, something that most of us tend to forget. Wills, testaments. And we'll have a look at that briefly in due course. Then of course, very important, the property division. Property division, which relates to the property maintenance division, is all about finding the right property. Once you found the property, then it intersects again with financial services and our good friends, Gerrit Elliman and them, to procure appropriate finance. And it intersects with the legal support services to assist the member with the legal process throughout. And it means registrations of transfers, registrations of mortgage bonds, and it also relates 
to finding of tenants, identifying the correct tenants, and managing those tenants, and ultimately managing the property of the member. Over and above that, imagine the reality that in P3 we have thousands of members from 19 countries throughout the world if you include South Africa. And I always in jest say that we have members in Papua New Guinea and I have no idea where Papua New Guinea is. And I would love to meet those members. Which has the following implication, if we do not provide all these services under one roof and we have a member who practices as a medical doctor in the United Kingdom in London and we do not empower that particular member to identify the correct property in South Africa, successfully apply for bond finance, procure registration of this property or these properties in his or her name, get the correct tenant, have the tenant managed, and if something goes wrong with this property, to have that dealt with. And this is where property maintenance comes into play. Now I have told you something that all of you already know, and this is a brief summary of the structure, which by now we all understand. Now, once we grasp that concept, and we look at the process, if we can summarize again, we call it a three-pronged approach. And if we have regard to what uh, the bank and the bond originators said to us this morning, you will identify the practicalities of the theory that we heard this morning. Let's take a few examples. The first thing is, of course, Preparation is step number one. We had some questions about exactly that. And it's as simple as that. It's again common sense. You need to know where you are. You need to know what your financial capacity is. If your capacity is inadequate, if your disposable income would not allow you to successfully apply for finance, you have to deal with that. And that's part of what we do. That's why we have partners and we're going to come to partnerships. Which means you have to prepare your profile as a consumer to the extent that it will make you acceptable to the financial institutions to lend you money. And it's as simple as that, isn't it? The second step is that of pre-screening of properties. Now we heard very interesting statistics this morning. And if we listen to what Jacques said and, and the questions uh, relating to that about areas, Bianca and I are primarily property investors. As a result of that, the reality is that we as the CEOs of the group and as attorneys and conveyances realize one important issue in all of this and it is you your finances may be a hundred percent in order you may have as much disposable income as you wish but if you do not find the property then it is in the air it has no consequence and that's why it's important that we dictate that the screening of properties is of the utmost importance. And we're going to have a look today at the approaches resulting from this. Now there's a number of various sources of properties. Of course, there are existing properties. And there are sellers in distress because of the economic circumstances. 
and you have sheriff's auctions resulting from people who have been unable to pay their bonds, etc., etc. Let me just say this. Sheriff's auctions, distressed properties, all good and well. But the one thing we have to understand, that is the difficult route. If you purchase a property at an auction from a distressed seller, you also purchase the baggage. You purchase the almost ex-owner who sits in that property and you potentially have to evict this person. You also purchase the reality of arrears, rates and taxes, arrear levies. And the problem with that is, if you do not deal with it, it will not be taken care of, which means it is a more complicated transaction. We get this question very often, and this is the answer. This is why we do not invest on a big scale in repossessed properties, properties in distress, share of auctions. Very well. If we purchase existing properties, then we look at properties which are clean. Of course, by now, most of you will realize that our first preference is properties in new developments. We will see why this is so. It is also a reality, if you look at the statistics, which we saw earlier today, there are certain areas where new developments simply do well for various reasons. Location, of course, one of them. Why is it that in Cape Town we do not have a large stock of properties? For the very same reason that you do not have potholes in the roads in Cape Town. What do I mean? It's a high income area where bulk contributions required by the municipality is three times as high as the bulk contributions required by the local authorities in Gauteng, for example. Bulk contributions relates to the following. If Unicon, and go and ask Unicon why they are reluctant to develop in Cape Town. If you purchase a piece of land, you have to rezone it. You have to apply for higher density occupation. At the moment, it is a single dwelling. What you want to do is you want to put up a block of flats, which means you have to have supply of electricity. At the moment, you supply one single dwelling. Now you have to supply 200 households with electricity. Similarly, sewage, waterborne sewage, one property being supplied, now all of a sudden you have 200, 300 toilets flushing. And then of course, water supply. Now, it is not just for building that block of flats. You have to approach the local authority. Now, people like Unicorn would tell you this in so much more detail than I would. This is a process. Sometimes it will take years to procure those rights and to find capacity from the local authority. It's also about access roads to and from, where in the past you had one single vehicle approaching that property or leaving that property. Now potentially you have 200 approaching and leaving. So if you look at all these bulk services, these services have to be supplied to that property, which means you have to increase capacity, electricity, potentially water, sewage lines, and access roads. Does it make sense? Now, Cape Town is the perfect example of an affluent city where the contributions which the local authority requires
to provide these services are number one of high standard and number two very expensive and therefore in jest I always say this is the reason why you do not have potholes in the roads in Cape Town but this is also why it's very expensive compared to yield we've heard about yield and it's expensive to develop a new development in Cape Town. Am I right, Sean? So that's the sad truth. The reality is this. What do we do when we buy property? We don't buy property. We accommodate tenants. Now many of you have heard this before. We go and look at the profile of the tenant we like. And very often, in most instances, as a matter of fact, this tenant is a decent middle class, middle income family. It is husband and wife with children, preschool and or attending school. Why is this so important? The parents who have children who have to go to school tomorrow will surely not rip out this fitting. Leave in the dark and go sleep on a park bench. Again, it's common sense, isn't it? And this is a person who has a stable job, who gets a salary at the end of the month. The 60% we spoke about, 60 to 64% are decent middle income people. And the middle class in any economy carries that economy. The middle class are the people who need housing. The middle class are the people who get salaries, who go to these very same banks and apply for credit, buy their vehicles, with a loan from the financial institution. Apply for insurance products and pay the insurance premiums. Buy toothbrushes, buy food. Those are the tenants we like. Now if you say that, then it leads you to the second important issue. And that is, this type of tenant is somebody who has a proven track record of stability and because of the very fact that this tenant has dependence they do not take chances with the well-being of their families and we love those tenants the other important thing is if we say that the economy is driven by middle-class people then it means we go and have a look at where those middle class people congregate. Where is the highest concentration of middle class people? Yes. Where there are jobs. Because by definition, these are people who have jobs. Look at the East Rand, Johannesburg, West Rand, Mid Rand. Pretoria, to a certain extent Durban. These are the areas where we traditionally invest for the simple reason there is the highest concentration of the tenants we like. So we find our tenant, we define our tenant, and then we find the property that suits this tenant. New thought, isn't it? It's just a slight tweak in our approach because as we will see with partnerships ladies and gentlemen your tenant is your partner if your partner fails you you have a problem with your investment for that very same reason we developed in the p3 group the ability to find the correct tenant, screen this tenant, and manage this tenant. Now, you also understand why we like 
new developments. Now you also understand why it's difficult to find the property in Cape Town that will provide for the needs of this middle class person. And there's the predicament. Or as some wish to call it, contradictio in terminis. What is a contradictio in terminis? It is just the fact that we say it's one of the most affluent cities <coughs> in this country. But we also say it does not cater for housing for middle class people. So, the third one I wish to dwell on a little bit is what we refer to as the ALAs. Now, some of our members here today have already indulged. The ALA is simply an acronym for the Alien Nation of Land Act, it's uh, Act 86 of 1981. Chapter 2 of this Act makes it possible for somebody to sell his property on installments and makes it possible for somebody to purchase a property on installments. Who didn't, who didn't follow that? You, you walk into the dealership, the car dealership, and nowadays all of them have their own financial services companies. What happens in reality, they're backed by the big banks. So you walk into that dealership and you say, I love this one million rand car. Or if it's Bianca, then it's uh, quite a bit more expensive than that. <laughs> now, but you do not have that million rand in your pocket. So what the bank says, as all good salespeople do, don't worry. Show us your payslip. Show us your income and expenditure. What is interesting, they seldom if ever ask us for our balance sheets, which is a different story. We'll have a look at that very briefly, because one of the things we need to do today is to caution ourselves against acts of insolvency. We'll have a look at that. What happens is they have a look at this, and they say, fine, you have disposable income, and we approve your application for finance. And they say to you the following, you can have the car. You're going to pay us the capital plus interest in a number of installments, 60, 70 installments nowadays. It goes up to 70, I believe, at the moment with balloon payments, massive amounts, and they lure you into the, the smell of new leather. <laughs> and what happens is the following. You drive it out, and now you are saddled with this installment for the next 60 or 70 months. The car is not yours. Who didn't know that? car is not yours. It does not belong to you. It belongs to BMW or Mercedes, financial services or whichever one tickles your fancy. And they say to you, you can drive it. If you really adventure you can lend it to your teenage son. <laughs> but you have to insure it. They will even go as far as to say the condition might be that it has to be locked up in a garage overnight, etc. All sorts of conditions. And you can drive and enjoy it. You have to service it. You have to pay your installment, you have to pay your insurance. And when you have paid the final installment, this car is actually now yours for the first time. That's an ALA. It's buying a car, on it's, it's buying land on installments like you would a car. Simple as that. Now this is becoming more and more prevalent. Ladies and gentlemen, the one thing 
that I would like to say to you today is when blood runs down the streets economy-wise it's the best time for us as property investors Warren you don't believe me <laughs> when the symbolic blood runs down the streets economy-wise when it's really going bad with the economy it presents us as property investors with incredible opportunities what did Jacques say to us today you can get bargains now because prices are not being increased or inflated as they were during the period 2006 to 2008 where you paid for properties where perhaps as we stand here on some of it you have not recouped that yet because of the overinflated prices during that period it means good value for money at the moment. And it means opportunities as far as the so-called ALAs are concerned. Because what happens, somebody bought a property three years ago at 500,000 Rand. He was fortunate enough to get a 100% bond from the bank. Included in that price was the estate agent's commission, Cedric. Am I right? And what happens is, as all of you know by now, after three years or five years, you have barely scratched the surface. You have not really started paying back capital because you have been paying mostly interest because it's a 20-year term or even worse, a three-year term. So now you're trying to sell it for whatever reason at the moment more and more so we will see that people will try and sell properties because they have difficulties in making ends meet but to try and sell that property pay the estate agent his commission and pay off the bond is near impossible which means the only way out for this property owner is put twofold. Lose it to the bank, alternatively sell it on ALA. How would this work? The outstanding balance is 498,327 rand and 13 cents and counting. <laughs> is another 17 years to go on that bond. This seller slash owner was very fortunate to get an interest rate from his bank at prime less 0.5. So what does he do? His installment is 5,000 Rand a month. He says to you as purchaser, to you as a property investor, he says, buy it from me for 497, 98,000 and whatever the rands and cents were. And you can buy it at an interest rate of prime less 0.5 and pay it in installments of 5,000 rand a month over the next 17 years. Did this make sense? Who didn't follow this? Like that luxurious car which we caution you not to buy except if you're stinking rich it's not your property until you have paid the final installment but you have the use of it and you have the enjoyment which means in practical terms you can get the tenant and you will get in the rental but it also means you have to insure it, if applicable. You have to pay the installment to the owner slash seller. You have to pay the levy. 
if it's a sectional title, you have to pay the municipal tax on it. You can see that it's, it's as simple as this. That's why we say during these times it is actually we are presented with so many opportunities that we do not get when the economy is flowering. Now, <clears throat> we spoke about partnerships. That's uh, the last one is, now remember, our developer partners is not only P3's partner, it is also your partner. Because you purchase a property from a developer and until that developer sells the very last unit in that sectional scheme, that developer remains part and parcel of the development in terms of the Sectional Schemes Act. It has a bearing on effective functioning of, for example, the body corporate. The financial institutions, notwithstanding what many of us believe, we love the banks. We love the insurance companies because they make it possible for us to be property investors. And even though we do comply, com, uh, complain from time to time that we do not get as many bonds as we wish, etc., etc., the reality is if a bank does not grant you finance, you will not be a property investor. Right. It's as simple as that. So they are our partners. And that's why we listen to what the bond originers say to us that we structure our lives and our finances accordingly. Of course, the professional service providers, the bond originators, the attorneys and conveyances who tend to the registrations of these transactions, the insurance advisors who provide us with risk cover that if we die during the duration of this bond, that we leave a debt-free property behind. Then, important, SARS, South African Revenue Services, is our partner, our lifelong partner. <laughs> I love SARS. And if you ask our auditor, Johan Grindlem, he loves SARS. Because SARS enables us to run property investment as a business. They provide us with incentives and allowances, and we're going to look at one in particular today, which makes it possible for us to become and remain successful property investors. Very well. Some interesting statistics. Ladies and gentlemen, have a look at this. Remember what Jacques and Gerrit said. 75% of your take-home pay, you used to pay debt. Shocking, isn't it? In South Africa, we can blame it, if you wish to call it that. We had a Minister of Finance in, was it the 70s, 1970s, Owen Horwood? And under the, I don't want to call it tutelage, I, I would almost say under the iron grip of the then Department of Finance, a debt culture was established in this country. Have you heard people saying that if I don't have debt, I cannot get a home loan? That's the truth. If you do not have a credit record, you will not get finance. Why? The financial institutions want to see that you, in the past, have regularly paid your credit obligations. So if you have no credit agreements, if you have no credit record, it means you cannot demonstrate that you have a good history as far as repaying your debt is concerned. 
Now this stems from those years where this whole debt um, fixation in this country comes from. We also heard that during 2008, the catastrophe economy-wise all over the world was actually in fact caused because of the credit crunch and the overextending of financial institutions in the United States of America. We still suffer those consequences today. Now, the National Credit Act had an interesting consequence, an unforeseen consequence. The National Credit Act, the NCA, was meant to limit the exposure of normal people to credit exploitation. In my humble opinion, it did not succeed in that. How many of you, most of you here have already applied for finance? So what happens if you go to the bank? What do they ask you for? Salary slip, yes. What else? Bank statements. What else? Credit record, yes. Residence, do you have a landline? <laughs> what about the balance sheet? Have they ever asked you for a balance sheet? Assets, liabilities. Some of them do, most of them don't. What is the implication? As a legal practitioner, we have been concerned about this for a while. The result of the National Credit Act and to a certain extent the Consumer Protection Act was that they are fixated on income and expenditure, disposable income. How much money do you have to repay your debt? It took the focus of the balance sheet. Now, many of you have heard me say this before. I'd like to destroy your weekend for you. Go and do this exercise. The accountants have what they call T, what do you call it, Johan? T, T accounts. T accounts, where you have debit and credit. One on the one side, the other on the other side. Credit is what you have, debit is what you do not have, what you owe. We talk about balance sheet. Other way around. Is it? <laughs> debit, <laughs> no. That's it. Good. Okay. So, if you, if you go and you say, okay, this brand new car that I purchased yesterday, I owe a million rand. That goes on the O side. And what do you put on the asset side? Nothing. It's not yours doesn't belong to you. <laughs> it's zero. The five credit cards we heard about this morning, that goes on the O side, 100, 200, 300, 400,000 rand. Believe you me, yes, that's indeed true. What can you show for it? After the dinners, after the trips, after the holidays, after paying school fees, university fees, uh, the shortfall on your salary. Nothing. But you have this debt on the O side. You bought furniture on credit. And now you have your brand new furniture in your house. You still have not paid your first installment when you've al already lost what percentage? 50, 60% in value? Yes? 
So if you, if you add up the numbers at the bottom, what do you find? You know what's the sad truth? You will find that you are bankrupt. Assets and liability wise, you are in fact insolvent. And if you go and look at the definition in the Insolvency Act, it is just that, where your liabilities exceed your assets, and you're insolvent. It's one of the definitions you have to add. But you, as a theoretical insolvent, you take your nice salary slip, your pay slip, and your exemplary bank statements for the past three months, you take it to the bank and they say, you have disposable income, we love you. And we'll give you an 800,000 Rand bond. What just happened? The bank granted 800,000 debt credit to an insolvent. Who does not agree with me? <laughs> Those are the grim realities. What I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, let's not, let's not live in this utopia that the Credit Act, the National Credit Act, and the Consumer Protection Act saved us. Because it didn't. Which means one thing. You have to take responsibility for your finances. You have to avoid expensive or so-called bad debt. You have to stop buying the big screen TV on credit today because you want to watch the game tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you have to stop. We all have to stop buying furniture at interest rates of 34, 36% per annum. It's bad debt. Being a property investor is a state of mind and a mentality. We're gonna have a look at, at some of this. This is what I have to say, this lengthy complaint about the spending of South Africans. Have a look at that, almost 90% of all South Africans spend more money than they earn. 58% of people in this country expect to continue working for a salary after their formal retirement. 62% of all South Africans do not cope. They do not make ends meet. 4.7 million South African adults gamble. The average South African, I love this one, spends 4,562 Rand per year on cigarettes. How many of you save 4,562 Rand per year? Okay, you always have the exception to the rule. <laughs> Only 54% of South Africans who are currently 10 years or less away from retirement age are actually saving for retirement. Pension fund members look to their pensions to provide 64% of their income eventually. And only about 6% of South Africans can maintain their standards of living after retirement. And there's the cash. This is why we are property investors. Okay. All of this have, this you, all of you have seen. Let me remind you. We get an increase, hopefully, every year. And you constantly earn more and more. But your expenses do exactly the same. When we retire, we immediately lose 30% at least of our 
monthly income because that's how our pension funds work. If you got a check, a paycheck of 100,000 Rand end of last month and you retired, the one you'll be getting next week sometime from your pension scheme will be 70,000 Rand gross. And there's problem number one. Immediately, you come up short with 30%. It does not end there. When you reach approximately the age of 68, you now find that because your pension does not increase to the same extent that your salary used to increase, your expenses because of inflationary pressure catches up with you. And then it finally overtakes you, and there's problem area number two. You may have heard with interest this morning that <coughs> EPSA Bank or Jacques had the interesting statement to say, as we stand here, it's not a market conducive for speculation. It's a market that calls for medium long-term investment. What do we do in P3? We buy and keep those properties. That's the first thing. That's, never mind medium, that's long-term. That's generational thinking. That's the first thing. Because we are aware of the fluctuations in the economy. The second thing is, we do not attempt to continuously refinance our properties. Please do not do this. Because if you consider your property portfolio to be part and parcel of your own retirement plan and your creation of wealth, and you go and borrow against it continuously, how do you grow wealth if you do that? So we do not refinance. We buy these properties, we pay them off as quickly as possible, we keep them. And we do not speculate in property. There is a vast difference between speculation and investment. Who did not get that? Okay. There we go. We say we accumulate assets. Wealth means, in our definition, that we procure assets, we invest in assets, which will do a number of things for us. The first thing is, it'll escalate in value in the long term. The second thing is, it will give us an income regularly dependable. The third thing is, the income which we derive from this asset will continue to increase. And we wish to make sure that these increases in escalation and value, as well as income derived from it, beat inflation. Did this make sense? Good. That's what we consider to be wealth. But, of course, we also want security, which means we protect these assets. We structure uh, our portfolios and our holdings, which will diminish and avoid risk to it. We take out insurance where and when applicable. We care for it. We maintain it, like anything else. And as you've heard, if I may you refer again to our senior partner, it's never too early. And especially during these times, it's never too late. Very well. Why property? Let's just, let's just have a look at that again. We've mentioned it gives us capital growth, gives us rental income and the escalation in the income. But what's important is this. We invest money, which we borrow. It means pre 
tax capital. If we accrue a fund of a million rand, that's our saving. The million rand that you have in the bank, do you agree with me? You have already paid tax on it. That's how you got it. So you've paid your tax, now you have left a million rand in the bank with property we get somebody else to grow our wealth. We ask the bank to lend us the money and we ask our very friendly tenant to pay back our bank loan. That's why we love our tenants. Which means they contribute to our wealth creation. And then of course, you've seen the statistics over the long view, it's historically stable. You have your ups and downs. But the trend over the past hundred years in this country had always been upward. And then of course, normal people who earn salaries and who have and can demonstrate disposable income can be property investors. Now, at this point in time, let, let me add this. If you approach the bank and you say, I'm going to buy a property for 635,000 Rand, and I want to borrow money from you, Mr. Bank, and my installment will be 6,400 Rand a month, for argument's sake. The bank is going to ask you to demonstrate your ability to pay 6,400 Rand a month, not 6,400 less your rental. Clear? The bank is interested in your disposable income now, not in what you will get or expect or hope in most instances to get. It's like the lottery. It's not there yet. So, if you have 6,400 Rand available every month, and you can demonstrate that the bank will approve your bond. Now, one of two things, either you've lied to the bank, which I hope you don't, or in fact, you have their disposable income. Now, what we're saying to you today is a tiny mind shift. <coughs> If you have 6,400 Rand a month available, use it. We're going to show you. Use it as opposed to abuse it. Okay, <coughs> let's have a look at this. We're taking properties. Uh, where's Shaw? As I mentioned, one of our good friends and, and develop, developer partners. We took one of the Butelier properties and we did um, an analysis. Now, we, uh, we use the example of one of the real properties and we, on the premises that we pay a 10% deposit. Now, here's our example of year one. We know our rental income on this particular property is 5,600 Rand a month. We know if we applied successfully for a 90% bond, our installment calculated 10.5%, which is the prime rate at the moment. And if you're fortunate enough to actually get that, then your installment will be 5,706 per month. Your rates and taxes is actually 270. During the first year, in Batelier specifically, you are excused from having to pay levy. In this particular development, you only start paying levy from the 1st of August or somewhere there, shall 1st of June, next year. Uh, thank you so much. Then, if you 
appoint a managing agent to manage your property. This one is calculated at 8%. Then you pay another 448 Rand per month. And lo and behold, you have a shortfall of 824 Rand. Remember, the bank was not interested in what your actual shortfall is. The bank asked you to prove that you can pay 5,706 Rand per month. Uh, I know, I, I, I return to this every single time for a very good reason. Because as I said, either you lie to the bank or that is in fact your position. Now, if we extend this, it's called by the clever financial people called extrapolation. If you're, you extrapolate this very same property, during year three, and this is the other reason why we used specifically Batelier, is because Batelier, which was completed the sectional scheme, I think, during 2014. Since 2014, it uh, demonstrated an 8% uh, average capital growth and an 8% increase in rental since 2014. So we ran all those numbers at 8% capital growth and 8% increase in income. Then it means year three, you would have rental income of 6532. Your bond repayment, um, I see we have 6340 because we increased the interest rate here to provide for what we certainly expect to, to be 11% at the end of this year, prime rate. And then the rates and taxes would have gone up, I can guarantee you that. Sorry, can you see? You must tell me if I'm in your way. And your levy is now kicked in and it's also been increased since year two. And of course your management fees have gone up as well. Notwithstanding that, you now have a surplus of 119 <coughs> rand per month. If we, if we look at the numbers a little bit down the line, this all of you know, you've all seen this, what we're saying is, again we're back to that principle of disposable income. If you invest from your own pocket, not the five seven, but two thousand rand a month, and you increase that with five percent per year going into the future, and you take all the surpluses that you actually eventually get on this property, and you also pay that into the bond, then the result is that your 20-year bond is then paid off during year 10. What we're saying today is we're still not happy with that. Then the trend you know and uh, the calculation of that is something that all of you have seen in the past. Is there's your, no it's fine, there's your Calculation. Whom of you have never used the wealth manager, property wealth manager? Okay, it's a good idea to start playing with it. You cannot break it. <laughs> if you break it, I'll give you another one. <laughs> now, there's your purchase price. There's your 10% deposit, which means your bond amount is 571. 500. Your rental income, this is at the end of year one, and there are the numbers. Now, if you change that a little bit, and you say, I will now, except for my shortfall, out of my own pocket, pay 1,176, that gives you that 2,000, own contribution. And you say you will keep on paying any shortfalls into your bond, 
notwithstanding the fact that you do not have a shortfall anymore. And over and above that, all the surpluses that you're getting, you will also pay into your bond. Who didn't get that? Makes sense. Three things. Look at that calculation, what happens. That very same property you pay off year eight. So you've reduced your 20 year term to eight years. Let's take it one step further. Let's say for argument's sake, of the five, seven you have declared to the bank, which you have allegedly available. From day one, you make a own contribution of 2176, which means three grand investment per month. And you do the very same thing. You maintain that shortfall as it is on day one. During later years, you pay it into the bond. And all the surpluses as you get those, you also pay into your bond. What is the result? Seven years. Okay. Just coming back, can I ask a question? Yeah. The strategy, I mean, this is based on you buy one property and pay it off. But your strategy, they say your analysis that you must buy five or eight or ten. You buy it as quickly as possible. But you buy it in the first year because it's also related to the bank. Yeah. It doesn't clash with what you show. No, it does not. Because remember, if you have five, seven disposable income that you can demonstrate to the bank, then you're going to get the one. Mm -hmm. If you have five, seven times five, which there are those, <coughs> believe it or not, let me just say this to you. Our second strongest, most affluent member in P3 owns just in excess of 2,000 properties. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, serious. <laughs> okay. I have to admit, he inherited a few million rand. And he did this. He leveraged his capital. He went to the banks and he got 70% bonds, 60% bonds. Because the 70% allowed him to have no shortfall. And he paid those off and he took all the incomes from those properties which he had paid off quickly. And he bought new ones and he applied for bonds on them. Again, 70% bonds. 70, seven zero. And he took all the net incomes from the paid off properties and he paid that into the new properties, new bonds. And it escalated to the point where he eventually started buying one property per month. And what does he do at the moment? He gets net income from 2,000 properties and he builds yeah, yeah. And what he does at the moment, he develops blocks of flats. And he pays that from cash flow. That's a principle. It's common sense again, isn't it? But it is apply your mind, be disciplined. And it requires a specific state of mind. It means you will not fall for the temptation to go and rush out and quickly buy that big screen TV this afternoon <laughs> on credit. And you will go and sniff the interior of somebody else's new car. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this, ladies and gentlemen. I go and I buy a six million rand property in Waterkloof. For those of you who do not live in Pretoria, Waterkloof is what they call in Afrikaans skuldbult. What is skuldbult? 
there where the people have massive overdrafts, huge, humongous credit cards, massive mortgage loans. Yeah, it's a terrible place. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, to add insult to in injury, they have all those potholes in the roads there. <laughs> and that's why they drive these expensive 4x4s. Four four. <laughs> so, you buy the 6 million rand mansion. You saw the statistics this morning. And you let it out. You rent it out. You let it. And you get for it how much? 40 at the month. If you're really lucky. <laughs> okay. Let's call it 40. Your installment on that 6 million is 62, 63,000 a month. Is this a good investment? No. That's a terrible investment. Right, the taxes are at least 6 a yeah. month. So it's not an investment. Location is great, but it doesn't do anything for you. So what do we do? We buy a property for 635,000 Rand, where we get, for starters, an income of 5,600 Rand a month. And we are assured of growth in that particular market segment on the capital where we actually beat inflation, if you actually believe that inflation is only 6%, but OK. And with the growth in your income, you actually beat inflation. Are you prepared to go and live there? Not necessarily. Because you want to live in Waterkloof. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, you're going to rent that nice house in Waterkloof for, let's say, 30 grand from the idiot who paid for it 6 million rand. Sorry, I, I, I realize I called a few people idiots, but OK. Uh, <laughs> that's a principle. Those of you who have not read Robert Kisaki's book, Rich Man, Poor Man, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, go and have a look at it. My understanding is that Robert Kisaki, who is a billionaire from property, does not own a primary residence. And it's this principle at work. Very well. So, this you've seen. Any questions about this? If we increase this, our own contribution in effectively to 4,000 Rand a month, which is 1,700 less than what you told the bank you have. Same story. You keep up shortfalls, pay it into the bond, etc., etc. Look at this number. You pay it off in six years. Now, to revert back to your point, is if you can demonstrate the fact that I can afford five or six times 5,700 Rand per month, and your structuring is correct, and it's, it's quite possible then it means those five properties you will pay off in six years. And out of your own pocket, it will in fact cost you 20,000 Rand a month. Johan always corrects my, my numbers and my calculations, as you've seen a few minutes ago. Now, what happens is this. If you look at it from this perspective, then it means the principle remains the same. Your finances need to be in order. You need to have disposable income. You have to find the correct property. And you have to invest in that property long term. You have to keep it. Now what happens if you buy the five, you pay it off. Six years from now, you buy another five or ten, and you do the very same thing. Then it means when you take that 30% knock on in income when you retire, you will not feel it. Because all these will be paid off, 
and you will actually enjoy the proceeds from those properties. And when you reach 68, and now your expenses outstrip your pension income, again, you wouldn't be bothered. That's the concept. It's as simple as this. That's why we say it's not speculation. It is long-term investment. Okay. And this is how we do it. Let's just use these. Now, an insurance company was offended by these numbers a few days ago when I showed them this, these numbers. And they say, okay, this is very conservative, which is true. These are the numbers supplied to us by probably one of the two biggest insurance companies in the country. That's it. There's the catch. Uh, let me say again, we do not hate insurance companies. We love them because they will insure our debt. Okay. But if you invest in a retirement annuity, 2,000 Rand a month over 40 years, according to those predictions, conservative predictions, you will end up with a fund of 850,000. And it'll give you an income of 3,500 Rand per month. And it'll be gone after 20 years. Because that's the nature of the animal. If you do the very same thing, and this example means you stop after 15 properties. The example on the right. You stop purchasing after you have accumulated 15 properties. And that's the result. Based on the Batelier numbers show, you end up with a 6 million rand asset, which the next year will increase to 6, 3, or whatever may be the case. And you derive in present day terms 40,000 rand net income from it. And in year 41, that will increase to 42, 43,000 rand per month. And that's the concept. Any questions about this? Now, when we say about the standard strategy, you heard this morning that the banks are a little bit more reluctant to grant finance to a trust than what they would be to an individual, for various good reasons, as a matter of fact. The banks miss one important issue, and it's a, it's a systems affliction. The bank systems, as a result of the Consumer Protection Act and the National Credit Act, are mostly de designed to avoid exposure and trouble in terms of the National Credit Act, like um, reckless lending, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So their systems are designed to fall strictly within the four boundaries of the National Credit Act. And they will comply with that no matter what you do or say. <coughs> Which is an interesting... If you look at the definitions, go and ha have a look at this. Definitions in Section 1, Section 7, Section 9 of the National Credit Act and the definition specifically of large agreements, you will find that the National Credit Act is specifically written to protect the individual. And if you, as the consumer or the borrower, is a juristic person, which means a company because a trust is not a juristic person, it is treated as one, but it's not, then in fact, you cannot rely as a company borrower or a trust borrower on the protection of the National Credit Act. Because the National Credit Act, as far as large agreements or credit agreements are concerned, protect the individual, not the juristic person. But the problem is this. They apply the very same rules which they have to enforce in terms of the provisions of the National Credit Act on the juristic person as they would on the natural person. And it's a fallacy which is systemic and we cannot at this point in time do anything about it. So, 
There's the, there's the old traditional structure. Natural person who pays tax on a marginal rate, which increases according to your income. If you earn in excess of 703,000 per annum, you pay 41% tax, etc., etc. A trust pays tax at 41%. It pays the highest form of capital gains tax in the universe. Capital gains multiplied by an inclusion rate of 80% multiplied by 41%, Niels. Whereas the individual, tax-wise, is completely different treatment altogether. What am I saying? If you're buying your first property, you will most certainly not buy it in a trust that I just shatter the holy grail. Is this your, uh, your living property or your investment property? Investment. Uh, primary residence will never go into a tax structure as far as I'm concerned. Because of your, your primary rebates and allowances on capital gains tax and etc. etc. And I never, we never treat primary residence remotely like we do investment property. Okay, happy with that. So, I will never buy my first property in a trust. The first thing is, I might just be able to get a 100% bond in my personal name. And I guarantee you, you will not get that in a brand new trust. It will not happen. The second thing, of course, is, there is absolutely zero tax advantage to buy your first investment property in a trust. As a matter of fact, if you pay tax there, you will pay 4,100 Rand out of every 10,000 Rand that you make to the receiver of revenue. You know, you remember that lifelong partner of yours? That's the reality. Also, we are faced at the moment with the developments subsequent to the Davies Tax Commission, where the clear stated intent is to increase the tax rate on trusts, probably up to 45%, Johan, I don't know what the latest is. Over and above that, the so-called conduit principle that we love to use, it's going to die. It's going to go away eventually because that's also the clear stated intent of the Davies Tax Commission. What are they saying? Tax the income and the trust, and then distribute it to the beneficiaries, which means tax it at the rate of 41%, and then give it to the beneficiaries. So those are the realities. And if these are not good reasons why you should buy your first investment property in your personal name, then I do not know what are good reasons. Okay, if we have a look at it a little bit further, let me just remind you that a trust is not a tax-friendly structure if you do business in that trust. I have the following problem, and it is, if you do use the conduit principle for as long as it exists, and I have a very good friend who's a chartered accountant who disagrees with me, because he has sophisticated ways of dealing with that, I have the following problem. Many people make use of double trust structures, etc., etc., and they do pretty well with it. I'm saying, as an individual, I would like to empty my personal estate. Because after my demise, after my death, I do not want to pay 20% of the value of my estate to the receiver of revenue, because as far as I'm concerned, that partnership came to an end upon my death. And he still milks me after I'm gone. So what I would like to do is I would like to make sure that there's not adequate assets in my personal estate to enforce estate duty, which is tax. Now, what I then do is I register a trust because I do need a structure where I 
am protected and where I can differentiate between growth of wealth and personal. And again, I keep my primary residence here because it has nothing to do with my investments. But I register a company and I purchase my company, my properties in my company. I pay 28% tax here which is far less than what I pay there and obviously is what I pay here. Over and above that, I have the distinct benefit that I can lend money into this structure on a shareholder's loan account. And eventually if I take it out of here, I reduce my shareholder's loan account instead of declaring dividends. But my big problem is this. If I do business in the trust and I accumulate wealth in the trust and I accrue income in the trust and I get rid of that income for tax purposes through the conduit principle. In other words, as long as it exists, I remove it from the trust the moment it comes in and I distribute it to the beneficiaries. What do I do? I never accumulate wealth here because all the profits I take out of it. And what do I do with my share? I bring it back into my personal estate and tell me how that makes sense. All the wealth that I grow there income wise, not capital wise, I take out of here and I put it, give it back to myself. And then, what then? This is my approach to it. Now, be warned. Your chartered accountant and other advisors would probably disagree with me. And as I said, many of them would make use of double trust structures, etc., etc. To me, as a property inv investor, I want something in a structure which is simple, straightforward, and a workhorse. I understand a company. Bianca and I are independent trustees in numerous trusts. And lo and behold, every single time that these trusts apply for bond finance, a bank calls, calls me and says, where are your financials? I'm the independent trustee and they want that from me, and they chase me all over the place. And the more I explain to them I'm the independent trustee, the more they insist on it. If I'm the director in this company, and the trust owns this company, the vast majority of the shares, then it means the bank will look to me as the director to be a surety, and not go and bother Gert, who is the independent trustee. So please understand why I say I want something that is practical, and it's a workhorse. And this is how we see it. Now, yes, I beg your pardon. Oh yes, oh absolutely. I've been preaching here yeah, that you should not lie to the bank and that you should not lie to the receiver <laughs> of revenue. And preferably also not to your spouse. Especially if you're married in community of property. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, those are all the taxes that have bearing on our lives. Now, we can spend days and days on this. The point we're trying to make what we've been saying all day. There's a difference between limitation of your tax exposure and fraud. And the definition is simple. The one you make use of what the receiver allows you, the other one you lie. So it's easy to know the difference. Okay. Now, we're going to look at section 13.6. You remember I, I said to you, SARS, the receiver of revenue, is your partner. If we take, like your example, and we buy five 
new bataliers. New and unused is the term. Section 13.6 of the Income Tax Act, it's a reasonably old act, it's actually a year older than I am, which means it's bloody old. It says the following. If you own five properties, and, or four properties, and you purchase number five, and one or more of these are new and unused, at the point in time when you become the owner, becoming the owner means registration in your name in the deeds office. You must tell me if you didn't understand it. If you tick all those boxes, then in respect of those new and unused properties, already during that financial year, you can claim a 55% of the procurement price. It means purchase price plus transfer costs and fees, etc., etc., as an allowance. Okay. I'm going to show you how this works. The theory behind it is the receiver loves property development for various good reasons. And it will give us a tax allowance if you invest in new and unused properties. But the very fact that they require you to own at least five properties also implies they want to encourage you to invest in property. Did this make sense? Yep. This section does it apply to your previous structure where the trust holds a private company and you are like a shareholder from the side? When you say you treat the property, is it to you as an individual or personal capacity or as in the company? It's about registered owner. So if it's you as a person, or the trust as the owner, and or the company as the owner, it's inconsequential, as long as you are a taxpayer. Which also means, of course, you actually have to go and register as a taxpayer. So if you own five properties in your personal name, you will qualify as long as one or more of those properties are new and unused. If you own, own five in the trust, same story. If you own five in a company, same story. The threshold is five. It begins at five. You have this, what we call a tax holiday, for 20 years maximum. I'm going to show you how it works. I buy five bataliers. Shal, I'm not even sure if there are 635 ones left, but okay. Is it? Uh, if I do that, look at the numbers, and uh, I'm deeply indebted to my auditor who actually corrected me my previous incorrect numbers on this. The total sum of those five units is 3,175,000 rand. If all five of them are new and unused, and they form part of a building, in other words, a flat, a sectional title unit, then 55% of the 3,175, the receiver <coughs> allows me as an allowance, which gives me the following. 3175 multiplied by 55% gives me 1746250. And then the receiver says, I can, at the rate of 5% per annum, over a period of 20 years, deduct 87,312 rand per year from my income. So if my income is, let's make it easy, 287,312 rand for this year, I can deduct 
87,312 Rand because of 13 sex from that income and pay tax on 200,000, which will have a very nice advantage in the sense it might me bring, bring me into a lower bracket income wise. Plus, I have this for the next 20 years. And that's why it's important, your question regarding the five and more. Now, remember, the whole proposition with land is there will be a point in time where you will generate net income. And that's why we like the 13 sex, because we have that for 20 years into the future to provide for the tax side. Now, of course, what, if you keep on going, you say, I pay these off, I buy new ones. And I incur more debt bond-wise. And I have shortfalls in the new ones, and I deduct it from my net income. The problem with that proposition is there will be a tipping point where no matter how many you buy, you will have this historical net income from all these previous properties that will exceed the possible deduction of shortfalls on your new properties. Did that make sense? Tax is like death. Sometime or another it will come to you. There's... Sorry, uh, uh, it says to a 2014 year of session, is that when section 13 no, no, this is a, it used to be a 13 ter, uh, about three, you on three, four years, until about four years ago. 2008. 2008, that's right. Uh, ter never really functioned, um, and uh, eventually it became sex, S-E-X, <coughs> which by the way is the, the Latin for six. <laughs> That's why I hasten to, to explain that. <laughs> but it is also a sexy section. You're absolutely right. I consider it to be. Yep. Yeah, so the other question is just, does the five properties have to be in one? Or is the Same owner. One? Uh -huh. Same owner. Same owner, but it says it's not Oh, no. It, 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 there's one. just one condition property-wise. All of them have to be in South Africa. And they all have to be used for business purposes. So if you own one primary residence and another three investment properties and you buy one more, you still want short because you're not running your primary residence as a business. You do not derive any income from it. So, uh, but they can be all over the place. Please, just not in POF other or the R or wherever, because it's just not a good, good investment property. The, the other catch about this is, and this is important, as it is at the moment, we can make use of 13 sex until the end of February 2020. Then as it is on the statute at the moment, it's gone after that. I sincerely hope, and my sneaky suspicion is they will extend it, but at this point in time it means we have another, what is it now, let's say four, three and a half years that we can still use 13 sex. If they do not extend it, it doesn't mean we lose the rest of our 10, 20 years, it just means that we will not be able to buy new 13 sex properties after the 1st of March 2020. So these next three years is the time to buy? Hoyom. Yeah. <laughs> New development only. New developments. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Does it have to be like in the same year of assessment or maybe if you can't afford it then you have to accumulate it then? Actually, good question. If you bought a new and unused property number three last year, previous financial year, Let's call it the 2016 financial year. Because at the moment we're in the 2017 financial year. And you buy property number four in this year, and you buy property number five, new and unused, next year after the 1st of March. 
then it means you will start qualifying for this allowance as from March 2017. You will lose the following. Your retrospective claim, quote unquote, in respect of property number three for financial year 2016 and 2017. And in respect of property number four, you will lose your ret ret retrospective annual deduction for 2017. But from 2017, 1st of March onwards, you will have the remaining term of the 20 years. Did that make sense? So you can spread it over the next four years if you so wish. As long as it is, if you reach number five before, as it stands at the moment, the last day of February 2020. Okay. Yep. The count for 20 years starts when you buy your first product. No. It's when you, in fact, reach property number five. That's when your 20 years on property number five start. If you bought number four a year before, you have 19 years left on number four. If you bought number three two years before, you have 18 years left in respect of number three. Okay. Can I make a statement? Yep. Best is to buy all five in one shot. <laughs> then this all kicks in all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Can I get a free bet today? <laughs> after, after you sold, sold the first 200, by all means. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as Johan said, tell me this is not a bloody sexy section. <laughs> it's great. Now you understand why I said it is also about partnerships. And now you understand why I insist my best partner is probably the receiver of revenue. When I buy my first little property in my own personal name and I make a shortfall for the first year on that, do you realize that because that is considered to be a business, that that loss I can deduct from other income in my personal name? How nice. Very well. Now, one issue here. I'm asking you to spend 3,000 Rand a month out of your own pocket on that battalia. In the same way that you pay your pension fund, etc., etc. Because remember, you've told the bank, I have 57. So, my good. Now, if I'm taxed at 41%, which many of us here is in that position, and I have that 87,000 Rand, where is it? There's a deduction. I save at 41% on that allowance 35,797 Rand per year. It's three grand a month. Yeah. So tell me you cannot afford that own contribution of three grand per month out of your own pocket. And this you have for th 20 years. You understand why I said to you earlier today, let's just tweak a few things. What I loved about the statistics that Jock gave us this morning, it confirms what we have been doing all along. We buy the correct property in the correct area at the correct price after we have done our homework correctly in partnership with the correct approved partners. And we look after our finances. And with all due respect, that's why we do not buy in Cape Town and invest in Cape Town at the moment. That's why we invest in Boxburg and Midrand and Batelier. And, and that's why we go and have a look at the history of Batelier and say, okay, I want that 8% historical capital appreciation because there's my proof. 
and I go and have a look at the property and I see the increase in income since 2014 had been constantly 8%. And that's why I choose that. Over and above that, I also face the reality that the tenant I like fits into that property. It's exactly the market segment I'm looking for. Now, if you look at the statistics, and I always believe you can do with statistics whatever you wish. And I really, really admire these economists because they have all this incredible knowledge at their fingertips. But if I look at an average, remember, in Gauteng, the growth in income in sectional title was 9.1%. Remember that yellow bar? There we go. If I get 9% per annum growth on capital and 9% growth on income, then of course that's where I go. It's in Gauteng and I choose sectional title. And that's what we do, isn't it? Great. Any questions about this, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Uh, there's your roadmap. I remember, Niels, I think I said to you, we find that the average member stops buying at approximately 15 properties. Then he stops investing. And I was wondering why that trend is. Until I realized we actually tell our members to stop at 15. Because that's how we predict the numbers. It's a power of suggestion. Now believe you me, ladies and gentlemen, obviously I have the gift of the gap. So I decided I'm going to use that. And I'm going to tell you today, that little entry there, finish building portfolio, we're going to remove it from this roadmap. Because why would you want to stop? It, you actually end up using free money as time goes on. Yeah. You, you, you get to a point where you actually use free money. Yes. Because it's not yours in the first place. Absolutely. You, everything you've created and the bank and everything is just given to you. Yeah. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, I am grateful for your presence here today. I am indebted, as I said to Jacques. Uh, it might not be that APSA appreciates when I tell them I'm indebted to them, but we are, because it fits in exactly with what we do every single day. And uh, I'm always grateful when I'm afforded the opportunity to Share what we love. And if you allow me in conclusion to say, we joke about our junior partner. But the reality is this. I probably have the greatest job in the universe. Because I work every day of my life with you. And you do not come to me because you're in trouble. Consider that for a moment. You come to me and you talk to me because you have ambition. And you're planning to make money and create wealth. Which is very different from crawling over the threshold and telling me in how much bloody trouble you are. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your presence. Any questions? It has to have an independent trustee. So when you look for finance from the time back, will they also... They don't. No. They will ask you who the shareholders are at the bank, but the applicant is the company. Yeah. They're going to ask you the details of the shareholders. Because in terms of the Financial Intelligence Centers Act, they are obliged to do it. 
But the finances in a company will, number one, be, as you heard this morning, the finances of that company and the finances of their director, who is, in fact, the driver. And they see and they look, they have a look at your personal finances and they like it, and they're going to make you sign surety. Over the past 50, 60 years, average growth of the property was 12 percent. Do you know what their view is over the next 20 years, the banks? Are they still looking at 12 percent average, or they dropped it? Actually, what started happening is they don't know for the following reason. You, you see, uh, you see, it's splintered in segments more and more so because of various inputs: security, growth, um, uh, concentration, age. For example, there are certain areas where the body corporates do not function and the banks flatly refuse to grant one single cent in bonds. They now go as far as to insist they want the audit, the latest audit statements of that body corporate before actually granting a loan. And they will actually um, refuse to proceed with the transaction if they don't get those audited statements. So it is now fractured where they now seem to realize, and um, John Luce from FNB also had a discussion, I'll try and find that, uh, where they predicted that the very expensive properties um, would the capital growth in a specific category be very, very small and even negative. And they have, for example, a, a number where it's, for example, in excess of 80 million or 100 million or whatever, like those rooftop units at the waterfront in Cape Town. Those probably have the biggest escalation in value in the whole country. But it is such a specialized field that somebody who can afford 110,000, 110 million rand for a flat. Yep. Yeah. Indeed, sir. One sold the other day for 110 million. That's a very unique, sophisticated market. And there everything goes. But the houses in waterproof, most certainly, growth-wise, will never see 12%. And that seems to be their approach at the moment. The low-cost end will never see that 12%. As a matter of fact, that will start getting less and less and less because what they now seem to uh, indicate is that the fast growing middle class means people who live in low income housing graduate to middle income. So the movement from the bottom is up into middle income and those who get into trouble from the top seem to move into middle income and that's where traditionally you would probably then expect uh, over the next 20-30 years that average of 12%. But it is now fragmented that you now have to differentiate in market segments. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, my first question is uh, from Peter. I haven't actually seen uh, properties from Centurion and here in the East. I just need to know the reason why. And uh, I need to find out because you said our first property should be obviously from personal property. And if I wanted to use uh, section 13 sex, obviously I'll have to at least have five properties if I can by the end of that year. But then when do you actually go into the company and how difficult is it to actually buy a property in the company because there's nothing? Okay. What happens is, keep in mind, I always say to you, do not buy your first property in a company and sp as a Certainly not in a trust, for all those reasons that I gave you. But what happens is the following. If you start buying property in a brand new company, then it has no credit history. So the bank has to look purely exclusively as, at you as the driver. That's why you stand surety. The moment when you buying property number two or three, that's the time, according to me, when you start moving into a tax structure. Your problem is this, I now have one property in my personal name. So now I buy number two and three 
in the company, which means I only have two in the one and one in the other. So what you then do is you have one of two possibilities. Either you continue to buy in your personal name until you have five, and you keep it there, which is not especially good tax planning. Because if you have it there and you want to use 13 sacks, you better keep it there. Because if you sell it, you have to repay the receiver the allowance that you got. So it means somewhere you have to make a choice. And if you wait four or five years to buy number two and three, then it means you have to pay off that bond on number one and sell it to your company, quote unquote. Or finance it at the outstanding bond in the company. And then from there on start buying the other properties in the new company. It's like anything else. It's a new business and you have to get to a point in time where you can show a credit record, income and expenditure, cash flow, that sort of thing. If you have 30% deposit and you're going to buy property number one, I will do it from the word go in the company. Because the bank is going to ask you for that 30% deposit and is going to ask you to sign surety. You will lend the 30% deposit against your shareholder's loan account to the company. The company will pay the 30% deposit, get the 70% bond, and from there on you go. But it's horses for courses. Did I answer your question? Good. <laughs> You're talking about the 13 sex. Yeah, because if maybe I had like my first two, maybe two properties and then now I realize that I can actually start buying the company and then I'm sending the other two into the company now that's gonna be cost implications for this Oh certainly yes. If you transfer it from your personal home to the company, you're gonna pay uh, transfer fees and costs. And if the price is in excess of 750000 you will also pay tax called transfer duty. But remember, that's why we invest in this, the properties that we do, 635. Uh, so we do not invest in those properties above that threshold. And sometimes in the bigger picture, remember, that's why I say it's horses for courses. If you literally have to get a 90% or 100% bond, I promise you, you will not get it in a brand new company. The only place where you will get it will be in your personal name. If you can afford to pay the 20 or the 30% deposit, that's why I say to you, I would then immediately start doing that in my structure and lend the money to the company, or if you do it in a trust, to the trust. <coughs> because that's where I want to start and that's where I want to keep on going. But you must keep in mind, many of our members are people who literally start out, they have X amount available and they do not have um, 100, 120, 150,000 rand towards the deposit. And then you start it in your own personal name and you have to be realistic. At some point in time, you're going to spend money on moving it into your structure. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, Johan, we do that quite often. As long as you're not going to try and use the 13 sex in respect of that property that you ALA, because of course that, that has that implication. But as a matter of fact, what you find very often, it's, it's actually a good thing that you mentioned that, especially with new members, nowadays we find an interesting thing. People become members and they're already property investors and they own lots of properties. Um, it, and what they then do, they then ALA the existing properties into the new structure. 
because number one, they have a very good interest rate on the existing bonds in their personal names, and they don't want to lose that. And the second thing is, they then gradually move that portfolio into the structure where it belongs. And they have the ability to do it at a value which is the best possible value that they can use. For example, municipal valuation. Now, very often we find that municipal valuation is significantly less than true market value. In other words, what you can actually get for it out there. And that's why I say, we do not lie to the receiver of revenue. But as a rule, if we say to the receiver when we have to declare uh, uh, for uh, transfer duty purposes, if we say here is the municipal valuation, as a rule, the receiver is happy with it. The moment when this purchase price exceeds 750,000 Rand, they look at it in more detail. Because now, if it potentially exceeds, if the municipal evaluation is 730, and the receiver has a sniff that this thing is in fact worth 900, they will ask you for two independent valuations. Because it's the difference between paying tax and not so you can see this is, this is a, it's not a game, but it is a calculation and it is a determining an, an, an analysis of it. But Johanna is right. When you have properties and you say, okay, I don't want it in my personal name because it, it has a future threat, then the easiest way what we normally do is we move it by ALA into the new structure. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? We have. Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you guys. Okay. On, on the structure, mm. is it really necessary to have a trust? Can we just have a company and then if shareholders in that company and then. Look. What advantage does it make to have a trust? The trust, as far as I'm concerned, don't make mistake. Do not get the impression I'm anti trust, because I'm not. That trust is crucial because it has to remove those assets from your personal estate. And the only way in which you can do it, if you are the sole shareholder in that company, it means all the assets in that company indirectly falls into your personal estate. Because you own that company and the company owns the properties. But if the company which owns the properties in fact belongs to the trust, then it's not yours. And Rose asked me if that's legal. Absolutely, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can you tell us a little bit on the rental insurance issue? Rental insurance is, is, is really good if you have a limited number of properties and you cannot afford to miss out on your rental income for two, three, four months, then it becomes really important. It is reasonably expensive because it is around about three and a half percent of your rental income, which is your premium then, around about three and a half percent. And if you do those numbers, you see it, it actually adds quite a bit to your shortfall during year one. But if you're cautious and you cannot afford to lose the rental for a period of a month, two, three months, yes, I would do it. What I find, once your portfolio is bigger, then of course the risk is spread. Then it doesn't really make all that much sense and I would certainly not take out rental insurance on 15 properties. That is absolutely ludicrous because it's just too expensive. So, there's my answer. Does it help with the eviction of the tenants? Well, it, <laughs> <laughs> it does. Well, how, how, how much does it cost if you don't have a, a rental insurance to evict? Okay, that, that, that tends to become ex expensive eventually. As you know, in the group, of course, members get 15% discount on all legal fees. But you still have to fork out the money 
to get that person who is sitting in your property and not paying and destroying it to get him out. And it's not that easy a process because of what we call the PI Act, the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act. And it protects that illegal occupant. And it's just the way it is. So what happens is, on average, if somebody is sitting there and refusing to move, it'll take you a good three months on average to get rid of that tenant. Because of the provisions of the PI Act. Yes, that's the reality. Uh, in terms of the structure that is proposed here, I understand the protection part of the asset structure. Is it also tax efficient when you consider that uh, tax, I mean, the trust is tax at 41%, you possibly go to 45 and you also have the company Twenty-eight percent, yeah. In terms of tax efficiency, how, how do you manage? Sandile, obviously, I do not want that income in the trust because I don't want to pay the forty-one or forty-five percent. And if I'm taxed at forty-one percent, I also don't want it in my personal name. And that's why I choose the company. I want that income in that company. Because if I have to pay tax, and I eventually get to the point where I'm making so much money that I actually have to pay tax, and I'm going to tell you something about that in a minute, then I would rather pay 28%. Because tax is tax, and tax somewhere along the line, you and tax will meet each other on the same road. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what I love about tax. I love paying tax. Because if I pay tax, it means I'm making money. Okay. So, yes, ma'am. So, the way to actually kind of, 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 of be that is to not have any income that is um, reported on the tax purposes and the trust. Correct. That's my take on it. And be forewarned, there are attorneys, tax practitioners, and accountants who have a different take on this. They have different structures to try and avoid that. I personally want it simple, straightforward, easy. And that's why I like doing business in a company. But I do need the trust to make sure that that wealth is created and kept outside my personal estate. But I certainly don't want that income in the trust. You're right. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize, and I know we have lots of questions, but I believe I have outstayed my welcome because the library will probably kick me out any moment now. <laughs> if, you, if you have any more questions, give us a shout. You have all our details. Thank you very much again for attending, and I hope. Um, if you have questions about the Batalia properties, just give us a shout. Uh, we'll uh, give you all that information.